Two years ago, I had this wonderful opportunity to sit with um, Helen Grant, OBE, um, talking about her life, you know, as a girl and as a woman, as an advocate. And of course, putting all of that into perspective of her work, her mission, you know, as a policymaker. And I thought, listen, it's, it's important for all of us to understand that to get our girls to be educated, we have to be on the same page all together. Around the world are moving, they're acting, they're relevant, um, they're forceful. But I find that the most successful women have had some kind of plan around their journey. Tell us about your journey and how it brought you to this Helen Grant speaking to Anita Erskine right now. Well, first of all, it's lovely to be with you today and, and thank you for inviting me to, to have this conversation. I was brought up by three really strong matriarchal women, my mother, my grandmother, and my great grandmother. And uh, my, my mum and dad had separated before I, I was born. And they were great women, you know, they had a work ethic um, and they were special. We lived on uh, quite a troubled council estate in the far northern city of Carlisle. And for a while, uh, when I was a little girl, I was probably the only person with a darker skin in that far northern city. And it was the 60s and 70s, I'm showing my age now, but it has to be said. And there was a fair bit of prejudice around me. But my home, notwithstanding the lack of money, was filled with love and care. Um, my my mum was a nurse, my grandma was a nurse, and they believed in education. And for me, they 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 felt that I should work really, really hard and aim really high. And you know, every night when I got home from school, I was expected to. You know, take off my uniform, hang it up, you know, fold it up, because uh, we didn't have a lot of money, look after it, and I'd be expected to really get on with my homework. When I'd done my, my prep, I went out to play, came in, had tea, um, you know, and went to bed. So it was quite a regimented regime, again, full of love and care, but education was important and knuckling down at school was important. I was good at sport and that did an awful lot for me in terms of my self-confidence and self-esteem. I was captain of most of the school teams for, you know, the, the sports that girls did at the time. Uh, hockey, tennis, um, uh, athletics. Um, and that self-confidence and self-belief that came through being good at sport actually spilled over into my academic work too, allowing me actually to go on and get good grades, good O-levels, good A-levels, uh, and off I went to read law at university. Um, I enjoyed that enormously. I, I, there's not many things that I, I hate, actually, but injustice uh, is one of them. So I think a career in law was the right thing uh, to do for me. Qualified as a lawyer, practiced, loved it for, for 23 years, focused around children law, family law, domestic violence, child abuse work. And after 23 years, politics beckoned. And that's what brought me to you today uh, as an MP uh, and as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Girls Education. So going right back, it, it, was, it was those women, the love, the care, the discipline as well, my experiences of life, you know, which weren't always easy, which taught me to battle and believe in myself, even though there would be detractors, even though some people would put me off or say, you can't do it. 
I always believed that I could. And that's why when I'm speaking to children today, I always say, you have to believe in yourself. Others will help, but the drive really does have to come from you. It has to come from your heart. And do not listen to people that try to say, don't do it. When you speak about your foundation, and these three extraordinary women, it makes me worry for a girl's vision, a girl who doesn't have that kind of support. But on the other side, I get excited because someone like you, you know, is at the forefront to help girls realize their dreams. And I guess that's what really brings you to the continent of Africa. That's what brings you to Ghana. Tell us about that. Tell us about this, this extraordinary mission, you know, that I, I'm so excited, I'm so excited about. I'm here, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm here in Ghana and I've, I've also been in, in Uganda, I've been in, in Nigeria, we're, we're off to Sierra Leone mm -hmm. uh, later on this afternoon. Um, we are here because the UK values the relationship that we have with Africa. Mm. Africa's success is mm. very important to the UK and of course it's important to Africa and I believe, and our Prime Minister believes too, that education is a huge part of that success. So here in Ghana and also in Nigeria and, and uh, Uganda, I've been looking at some of those successes that African countries have had in terms of education, but also being able to look at what more needs to be done, what the challenges are, what the hurdles are, how together we can overcome them, and also how we can partner more together, what programmes we can do, and of course, how we can build back better from COVID-19, which has, mm. of course has had a devastating effect uh, on education uh, and of course on girls. So before you tell us, you know, what being a special envoy really entails, do you find yourself sometimes, you know, working on these global projects, thinking of your life and how you started and now thinking of the girls for whom you are fighting? Do you find a connection between Helen's personal life and the world's girls or Africa's girls? It's, it's, it's one and the same. You know, I've been a girl, albeit sadly, you know, many <laughs> years ago. And, you know, I, it's with me all the time. It's what mm. drives me on. I believe in it. It's a game changer, Anita. If we can look after our girls, make sure they have all the opportunities that you and I did to have an education. It's a huge enabler. So I, I absolutely believe in it. And every girl should have the same opportunities to learn that, that I have had. And, and that's what drives me on. And I will not stop. I will keep going uh, for, for, for as long as I can. Why Anita Erskine Network? Because I think that Home is truly where the heart is. You know, home is where you have the utmost confidence and comfort in talking about who you truly are. And sometimes home is also the place where you lay a table for others to sit, to eat, to share. And that's what this network is all about. First of all, if you look at the design, right in there is this, the Edinkra symbols. Because Africa is important to me no matter where I go. No matter which space I find myself in, Africa is at the core of everything that I do. And then you can check out the cities and the beautiful skylines I've placed right on the logo. It means that no matter what we do, it's important to plug into what the world is turning out into. As African as I may be, as global as I may want to be, it's important to make sure that wherever I step, Africa comes along with me. Anita Erskine Network is for anyone and everyone who is interested in talking a talk that will lead to tomorrow's action. Helen, tell me, educate me, what in your mind, with your experience, in your vision, is the connection between women empowerment and girls' education. What's that thing in between? How would you describe it? It's just 
a huge enabler. Mm. If you're educated, if you can read and write and make sensible decisions based on information that you have before you, it's empowering. And that means choice. And that's very important for women, to have choice, to be able to say yes, no, forward, back. This is where I am going for me and my family. Very important. In your career as a lawyer, did you come across any subtleties? Did you come across any experiences, etc., that prepared you for this particular particular role? I should have asked that before, but you're talking about girls and you're talking about your current uh, portfolio. And I'm wondering, how did your career as a lawyer prepare you for this ginormous, you know, job you have ahead of you oh, or that you are in right now? That's, that's a, quite a difficult question, Anita, mm. but I think it made me into maybe even more of a fighter mm. uh, th than I was anyway. I think I was probably born that way and, and the influence <laughs> of those women, you know, they would say, come on, Helen, you know, go for it. Even in my sport, you know, they would be willing me to win, willing me to fight, uh, willing me to work hard, willing me to do the best I can. Um, and in the law, you know, it's quite like that too, because you're, you're advocating for your clients, you're looking after their interests. And many of the clients that, that I looked after were some of the most vulnerable, marginalized young women and sometimes children. And, you know, that's what you have to do when you're a, a, a domestic violence and child abuse lawyer. You know, you've got to fight for your client because sometimes she, she can't do it for herself. So I had 23 years of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it prepared me quite well for, for politics, including, <laughs> it has to be said, that the, what, you know, the House of Commons. Because, yes. you know, politics can be a, a rough, tougher old game. But um, I think it prepared me well, the law. And again, this, this feeling of a dislike of injustice. And I think girls in particular not having those same opportunities for various reasons of education is an injustice. It's a right of every girl to have those chances, to have those opportunities, and then to make her decisions. After the break, we talk about COVID-19, its impact, and how we need to rally up together and change the world for the better. We'll be back on Shiro's with Helen Grant. Why Anita Erskine Network? Because I think that home is truly where the heart is. You know, home is where you have the utmost confidence and comfort in talking about who you truly are. And sometimes home is also the place where you lay a table for others to sit, to eat, to share. And that's what this network is all about. First of all, if you look at the design, right in there is this, the Adinkra symbols because Africa is important to me no matter where I go, no matter which space I find myself in, Africa is at the core of everything that I do. And then you can check out the cities and the beautiful skylines I've placed right on the logo. It means that no matter what we do, it's important to plug into what the world is turning out into. As African as I may be, as global as I may want to be, it's important to make sure that wherever I step, Africa comes along with me. Anita Erskine Network is for anyone and everyone who is interested in talking a talk that will lead to tomorrow's action. Helen, I can speak for Africa. I can't speak for the world, but I can speak for Africa and her numerous socioeconomic challenges, which existed before we got hit by the global pandemic. So I can only imagine that some of our challenges were aggravated by COVID. How do we build back better for our girls? How do we face the realities of COVID? get ourselves out of it, and then continue to find that balance we're looking for? 
Well, you're quite right. Uh, even before COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, it, it has to be said the world was facing a learning crisis. But COVID has made everything so much worse. In fact, it's been one of the biggest distractors, uh, disruptors uh, of, of education in our history, affecting 1.6 billion uh, children at the peak of the pandemic. Many of these children are girls. Many of them will never, ever return to school. Many of them will never start school, lowering their chances of having decent livelihoods and getting good jobs and, and fully participating in society, which is what we want for them and which is what they deserve. And we also know that out of school girls too are more at risk of pregnancy, violence, forced marriage, early marriage, FGM, human trafficking, the list goes on. Unless together we do something about it globally, there is a very real risk that we will have a lost generation of girls and that would be devastating. So we need to act. And this is part of the mission, part of the message. And there are many things that we need to do. And you mentioned it at the very beginning, actually, of this section. You talked, you spoke about rallying the world. And we need to do that. We need to rally the world behind girls' education. We need to move together. And many of these global targets, you know, 12 years quality education, the G7's foreign and development minister's commitment to getting 40 million uh, more girls in schools and 20 million more reading by 2026. These are global targets. And of course, they require a, a global response. So we need to move together and we all need to pick up the baton here. It can't just be a few nations. We've got to move together. And I do think the international community need to be more ambitious in their approach. And we need to move together. We need to be more coordinated. I also think there needs to be more focus on quality education. Many of our children, many of our girls certainly are going to school, but how much are they really learning? Are they just sitting at the back of the class and, and, and listening? but they need to be able to learn. I think there needs to be even more focus on secondary education too. It's one thing getting basic numeracy and literacy, but I remember when I was at school, you develop all those skills and extra knowledge that allows you, again, to fully participate. And it, and it gives children, particularly girls, uh, even more confidence. I also think we need to listen much more to our girls about what they say they want to need from their education, not us as politicians telling them, but we need to listen to what they say because they know, they're the girls, they're at the coalface. So whether it's safer roads for safer walking to school, free sanitary products to help with confidence and school attendance, or separate toilets for, for privacy, but we've got to listen to our young people very carefully and act. And the last thing, and this is something that we all can do, your viewers can do it too. We need to encourage and lobby our leaders to speak out much more about the importance of educating girls and the advantages for girls and women, their parents, their children, their communities, and their nations. And that's something everyone can do. It's a conversation and we need to keep sending out that message of all the advantages. Helen, first you're human, then you've been a girl. Now you are a woman on a mission to change the world. And I believe in your mission. I believe in you, honestly. The African girls believe in leaders like you, but they also want to hear what you have to say to them about their dreams and their ambitions. What would you say to that African girl if she was sitting right in front of you 
And if she needed to hear one thing, or two or three, what would Helen Grant say to her, the African girl child? I would say, we love you. We care about you. You can do this. We're working hard to move the dial, to give you all the opportunities. And I would want that child to believe in themselves mm. too. Believe in themselves with all their heart and soul. Mm -hmm. And do not be put off by people that might try to put you off, but believe in yourself because I know they can do it and we're with them. Helen, I mean, I miss the, the horns and the sirens and everything going on. You spent this very important time with me. And I know you've got so much on your shoulders, but just as you've spoken to the African girl child, telling her that you we really love her and that we're here for her, the same thing I want to say to you. You've got an inexplicably huge task ahead of you. But I want to share in the vision those three matriarchs may have had for you and for your greatness. You know, no pressure, but we believe you will make it happen. We believe you will make the African girl's dream come true. And we're behind you 100%. We know it's a huge task, but it's why women like you are created. It's why sheroes like you are created. It's because not all of us can lead, only a select few. And so your dreams, your ambitions, when realized, will indeed realize the dreams and ambitions of many more of Africa's and the world's girls. So a big thank you for coming on the show and a big thank you for your selflessness. I mean, this is a huge sacrifice. You've got a family of your own, right? So this is a huge sacrifice. Anita, it's been wonderful to be with you today. Thank you for all that you do too. We are on this mission. Bless you. Bless you too. And I look forward to the next time. Absolutely. It's a boss lady thing.